everything in the initial chapters two of Second Corinthians. However, however, he emerged from this thinking with a triumphal note, proclaiming in chapters four, verses eight and nine, by saying, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but we are not despaired. Persecuted, but we are not forsaken. Cast down, but we are not destroyed. Paul did not allow this small person prospect of death to deter him from his mission to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the city of La Corinth where everything was going in. Uh, some of Paul's anguish, although may have been caused by false teaching. Folks still do that even today to you. They can cause you to have hurt in your heart by lamb blasting what you are trying to say and do. And that not only happens outside of the church, sometimes that can even happen in the church. So he is referred to us and whether his opposition included death threats, it is uncertain. But we know that Paul upon us was not above resorting to, to such intimidating examples as we have seen in chapters 18 of the book of Acts. There, um, they tried to plot against Paul to try to keep him from preaching and even try to get the governor into it, but he would not be a part of that. So even so, Paul did not fear dying, for he knew that Jesus, and we need to know this, had defeated death on the cross. Amen. For we know, or we should know, when we're believers, that death is but a channel, a chasm, a passing from this life into life eternal. And we'll see that I'm gonna come back to that later on in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul also knew that in his day, there were many theories of what happened to people after death. Like folk running around day talk about a whole lot of hell. The Greek pagans, the Greeks generally believe that the underworld place where the dead live what we call the gods of or God or Hades, if we use that word as hell. It was a place of residence for the soul released from the body. And you can see a similar piece of that in Luke 16, where this rich man died and was buried and in so and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Some of the Jews and some Greeks believe that. No, there was no existence of death, and that even happens today. You got some people today who don't think that they think that when you're dead, you're done. Fact about it, none of y'all were old enough to do none of this. But back in the 40s, uh, somebody in the early 50s, somebody wrote a song. Some no, it might be uh, y'all would listen to stuff like that in 19 in the early 50s, like I was. Hey, everybody, let's have some fun. You don't live but once, and when you're dead, you're done. Let the good time roll. But I think I need to tell you though, that sounded good back in that day, and I went along with it because I didn't know no better. But when you're dead, you are not done. Even and according to the book of Revelation. The sea gonna have to give what the dead is within them. And we're gonna all have to stand before God. Hey, man, you're gonna have to stand before God. Uh, 
most for most of the Jews believe in a future resurrection. After all, the dead who would receive uh, reconstructed bodies are in order to stand before the Lord. And you can see that in John chapter 11, uh, when with Jesus had some friends, two close friends, the three really, Mary, Martha, and our brother Lazarus. Jesus was in one place, and the sisters sent a messenger to him to told him to come in a hurry. He who him loved was sick. And Jesus uh, deliberately waited until after Lazarus was dead. And when he came into the village of Bethany, the sister said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother whom thou lovest would not die. Jesus told him that he would live again. And she said, I know he's going to live again, Lord, in the resurrection. But he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. Then he asked her, do you believe this? And finally he says, to show me where you have laid him. And when they showed him where they, where they had laid him, not that he didn't know, they showed him where he laid him. And he called him and he got up again from uh, the dead. The resurrection, but the resurrection of Jesus from the dead on the third day, rather at the end of a general resurrection, brought yeah, everything is. into a sharper focus about the Lord. Well, you and his Join apostle, the meeting. You and his apostle thought momentarily that he was not going to rise again, but early in the morning, thank God for the women. And they went early on the third day morning. They found that angels were there. And they told them to go quickly to the disciples to meet him. And then even later on that day, Jesus stepped to the door. And his apostles found out that he was alive. Like Thomas, some of us are like Thomas, who said, except I can see the print of the nails in his hand and holding his side. I can't believe that's too preposterous for me. Jesus knew what he had said. He showed him that and he said, my Lord and my God. So there is hope. Fact about it, there is eternal hope for everyone that, that, that truly believe that Jesus is the Christ that God resurrected him from the dead and that after he had been here for a while, he went back home and he is alive today. Now, I said to us earlier on, I would suggest now that you go back and read chapters four, more chapter four of the book of Second Corinthians for it just begins at verse 16, but let me back up just for the sake of reading to verses 14 and then come to 16. Knowing that he which is raised by the Lord Jesus shall rise up also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things uh, for the sake that the abundance of grace might true the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Then he makes this profound statement. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man may perish, this old body, yet the inward man, that is a man we don't see, is renewed day by day. Having made a strong point about the resurrection, Paul moves into an implication. In so doing, he begins by using the Greek word translates for which cause, 
that he used elsewhere seven times in this book. The translation of these other seven times is whereof and therefore, whereof and therefore. This particular word usually implies that what the writer has just been talking about is self-evidence of what the author is talking about. Paul speaks openly in the previous section concerning the proper or the prospect of his death, hinting that his life was in jeopardy. I suppose most of us, many of us, who call ourselves Christian, we know in our life is in jeopardy, folk was wanting, wanting to hurt us, kill us. For being a Christian, folk wouldn't have to worry about us too much. We'd go ahead on and believe it or not. But with Paul, he said, for whether we live or whether we die, we live unto the Lord. So he preached Christ, not himself or his friends. This is the point whether his life was temporarily that, and that is his earthly life was relatively less important than his eternal life. In other words, this life that we're living now really is not so important, but what we're going to spend eternity after this life is what's important. Then he used that phrase in Ephesians 16, that the inner man, how the inner man is strengthened day by day because of what we have uh, in the Lord, the inner man, that man you can't see, that man that keeps that give you that option, if that's a good word, to just help you to keep going on. Not for any little, any little thing, any little kind of distraction can so some of us to turn around, but you need that inner man within you to keep pushing on. That's why I believe Paul said in um, Philippians 3, 14, I'm going to press on toward the mark of the prize of high calling. That's important. For our light affliction, small things, which is but for a moment, momentary affliction, Paul put into perspective the danger regarding his safety and longevity by calling the threat light affliction. Light affliction. In other words, you can kill this body, but you can't kill the spirit that's on the inside. Qualifies this as our extended and his comfort, com comforting perspective of all to a known one. No one is exempt from worry caused by our mortality and the eventual death of those we love. But when compared to eternity, that makes up our future. These tribulations of this stuff they are going through with is just but for a moment. For a moment, it's going to be over. And they ought to do what he said in verse 17b. Work it for us. I like that us word. A far more exceeding and eternal word and glory. In contrast of these light afflictions, what those stuff will be going through. Paul extolled the heaviness of the weight of our future glory. This is a play on word. Paul writes the Greek word, and he can speak both Hebrew and Greek fluently. What he was trying to say to them is, in one way, he writes this word for honor as glory. Thus, what he's trying to get us to understand is, whether we live or whether we die, we ought to be and make sure that we are in, hooked up with the Lord. Light of fiction. Uh, ultimately irrelevant, don't make no difference about our light affliction. The phrase working for us 
carry the sin of causing us. The same word of translation in 2 Corinthians 9 11. I was struggling with life. I was struggling with life will yield the results of inexpressible and unimaginable good. What you're going to have to learn is you have to struggle with life. You break the right, you got to struggle with yourself for you to make it into glory. Remember, I made myself a note and said, remember, no cross, no crown. You got to struggle. In other words, bearing a cross sometimes can be rough, but you got to struggle. And if you don't carry the cross, you can forget about the crown. While we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they are just temporary stuff around here. With the things which are not seen, these are the things that are eternal. Paul continues to kind of speak in paradoxy. We should not focus our sight on trouble in life, but instead on our attention of things which are not yet seen. In Romans 8, 18, he says, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed on those men in that 28th verse, he said, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. In other words, whatever you go through life with is for the good of them that love the Lord. To see the unseen, we must have eyes of faith trusting the testimonies God has provided. We do not want to be without excuse. The verdict on those who fail to discern the invisible qualities of God, even though they should. Romans 120, in your spare time, look at that, and that verse will say to them, even the th eternal things from that was not existed. So we are we are not without. Let me just read it. We are without excuse. Romans one, uh, Romans one, Romans one, Romans one, twenty. Romans one twenty. Are you there? For well, the invisible things of Him. On the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even by the eternal power that God here, so that we are without excuse. That old song we used to sing, remember, no cross, no crown. Many of us want the crown, but we don't want to go to no trouble. Thing I need to tell you, it's kind of like working. If you don't look, if you don't do no work, there's no need you looking for a paycheck. It ain't gonna happen. Even more now, we do experience the, the eternal, our future weight of glory. We must do this with hearts of faith. We must do this with hearts of faith, not crushed by the complexity and disappointments of life. We must live out 
the assurance that come from believing that God raised Jesus from the dead and will raise us up too. In 1 Corinthians, it says, us, for in this life only, 1 Corinthians 15, if we have, if this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all creatures most miserable. There are just some things of God by faith that uh, we ask and hope and that we really need to know. And here's a verse that's in the fifth chapter. That's why I said you need to count by more. Fifth chapter. This verse kind of really stands out. For we know if our earthly house of this type of nickel is dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternally in the heaven. In this verse before us, Paul draws on biblical images of a tabernacle as a way of understanding our body's existence. The tabernacle, oh yes, some of y'all don't know what I'm in, in before before they find said they had the tabernacle was carried by two men on each side, which had some of the stuff that Moses had in with the showbread. The rod of Moses was on the inside, but the tabernacle it was carried from place to place until finally they got to a place where they actually built the tabernacle. But at once at one time it was moved from place to place until finally it became to be a permanent place. The tabernacle was a movable tent that was eventually replaced by the temple. Thus, this metaphor inside the impermanent nature of our bodies. Paul did not fear the destruction of his earthly house of this physical body because he had the assurance of another building, permanent structure. This eternal living place has prime real estate location in heaven. John said it's beautiful over there. For in this, we do groan honestly, desiring to be closed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. This situation of living faithfully while facing the impending death brought Paul to a point of groaning, a word he used for inward longing. In 2 Corinthians 5, 4. Now he that has wrought us for this same said thing is God, who has also given unto us the honest in this, let me read verse six. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are in this temple, this body, we are absent from the Lord. The challenge of this life sometimes overshadows the magnificent of our future life in glory. A few years early, Paul endured in prison in Rome. He went on to say, 
in Philippians 121, <clears throat> for me to live is Christ and to die is yet. In other words, as long as I live, I will be doing what I got to do with Christ, for Christ. And to die is going to be gained. Then it finally says in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And every one of us is going to have to give an account of the deeds that have been done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. In this next world, in this next world, when we have given our resurrected bodies, we put on incorruption and immortality. First Corinthians 15, let me just read that. First Corinthians 15. Uh, first Corinthians 15, I want to begin at verse 51. First Corinthians 15, I want to begin at verse 51. Are you there? Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be chained in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be chained. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your stain? I like uh, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. For we know, should know, that our labor is not in vain. For we that is in this time of naked, new grown, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but clothed up one with mortality might be swallowed up in death. Paul's future comments on the reality of the right now versus the coming reality of the not yet, the burdens of life are known so well and experienced so often that we need not even offer an example. They are in the public dominion of our common knowledge. The main problem with these burdens is that in directing our attention to the as is, we take our eyes off what they to be. Paul acknowledged that disregarding Disregard build on what Jesus said in Luke 8.14. Let me just read Luke 21. Turn with Luke 21. Verse Luke 21. I won't be out of there. Luke 21. Verses 34 36, Luke 21. I'm trying to get out a bunch of paper in my book here. Luke 21. We're there. 
Luke 21, verse 34 says, and take heed to yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with suffering, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And so that day comes upon you unaware. For as a snare, shall it come on all those that dwell or live on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be accountable, worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man which he said, stand before Jesus. Paul here is doing what the old folk used to say, make it plain. Paul makes it clear that we should not expect a future existence without a body. Yeah, when I first heard an old man uh, talk about that. I hadn't thought about that before. And he draws upon what John says, for we know, for we know when this house of this is happening, we got another building. We got another building. We got another building. Um, unlike the Greek philosopher of the time, Paul of Pharisee, would never expect a permanent eternal existence as some sort of free floating spirit. What he longed for was that new body at the time when mortality with all this limitation and frailty would be swallowed up into life as Paul stretched to the Corinthians in his first letter in the resurrection of death. Death is swallowed up into victory. Just read that to you a while ago. Then he finally said, death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? With thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, he has wrought us for this self-same thing as God, who also has given us, I like that word, the earnestness of the spirit. Paul, retreats a bit for this future celebration of his own freedom from death to bring a present reality to his readers. We do not just wait for the glorious gift of God. We enjoy some of that stuff right now. We use the phrase here, chief among these things is the spirit of the God given us as an earnest of the future, things we may think of earnestly as in money, whatever. We need to have some stuff that we can use while we are on this side uh, of the grave. This present gift of, of the Holy Spirit in our hearts given, given at baptism. In Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came back out of the mighty Russian wind, many all were those that did not believe in it. He finally said to them in, in Acts 2.28, repent, every one of you in the name of Jesus, 
and you can get this gift of the Holy Spirit. He assures, assures us that God fully intended to carry out his side of the contractual agreement. Romans 8, 16 to 22. I'm going to read that. Romans 8, 16. You remember in Romans 8, 1, which says, therefore now, there are no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walks not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse 16 uh, says to us, the spirit himself, your Bible would say itself, but that's the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the cheering of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, then we may also glorify with him. Then he says what I said before I go in 18, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be given unto us. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travail and pain together to now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves. We, for the adoption, to which the redemption of our bodies. Henceforth, Paul says to us, we're always confident, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. One more time, trying to get us to understand. Therefore, we always come, that is the believers always confident knowing that while we are in this house, this body, we are absent from the Lord. Uh, during the time we exist in our current body, we cannot experience the full presence of God to be at home in our present bodies mean to be absent from the closest presence of God. This was the result of sin with Adam. While Adam, before Adam and Eve, listening to the false instruction of the devil, they were with God. But when they listened to the false instruction of, of, of Adam and Eve, it resulted in them being put out of the Garden of Eden. God's holy nature just does not tolerate sin in his presence. His holy nature is connected with his glory. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read that Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord, and I saw him high, and I saw him lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Finally, when he get down about verses 8, he says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall we sin? And who will go for us? And because as he had been in the divine presence of God, he said, here am I, Lord. Send me. I will go. I'm afraid to ask some of y'all do too much stuff because 
I don't want to run your road. Once you've been in the presence of the Lord, you need to know that God has some work that need to be done, and he need humans' hands to do it. Amen. You don't need to do no spiritual work. You need to do some physical work sometime uh, for him. For takes us a little time to get there. We walk by faith and not by sight. Many of us, what we can't see, we don't believe. I don't know anybody that have been able to see faith. For the record is in Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things not seen. You can't see faith. You will just have to step out on it and believe that God is. Our lives must be controlled by the things we know to be true in a sense of faith that is based on evidence. Paul expressed this in one of his greatest statements of the Christian life. We walk by faith, not by sight. Paul's own ministry stands as a testimony to this mindset as indicated by his enduring hardship and obedience to his call and purpose in the ministry. Got in trouble, but he still pressed on. We're confident. I see unwilling to bear something from this body that we can be present with the Lord. Other words, and to be present with the Lord, we're going to have to do what a lot of folk is afraid of. We're going to die. Once more, Paul affirmed that death did not deter him or cause him to be fearful. He was confident in his ministry. Like, if God called him to be absent from this body to die, he would accept that willingly. He knew that his death would mean experiencing the full presence of God the full inheritance of his salvation, of which the Holy Spirit was the down payment. In Revelation 20, talks about the fact that when we pass from death into life, we're going to be able to see the Lord for ourselves. Well, for we labor God Almighty, what present or absent, we may be accepted to him. Regardless, the open and wherefore, we see connections in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 4, 16. This conjunction, Paul, connects the idea of our labor, our labor for Christ is not to work for salvation. According to Ephesians 2.89, it tells us for by grace are we saved through faith. And that's not yourself. It's a gift. You don't work to get it. It's a gift that is given to you. And since this gift is given to you, if you're going to have it, you're going to have to accept it. For we must all appear 
we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us will have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Then every one of us may receive the things that have been done in our bodies, whether they be good or bad. That's right. You're going to have to appear. You're going to have to stand before God. And whatever the Lord says, our little conversation ain't going to mean nothing. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to have to give an account. I'm going to put a word in there. Of all the deeds that have been done in our body, whether they be good, or will they be judged At the judgment seat of Christ will occur an evaluation of our life. This picture of a time of future heavenly judgment is consistent with Paul's teaching and what he says in, in 17, Acts 17, 31. He had us to know that we're going to all see the Lord for ourselves. Let me just read, let you read the Acts 17, 31. Acts 17, 31. Some of us need to know that. He spoke these words after he had left Athens in Greek and met with the Agrippagites there. And then in verse 31, he says to us, because he, God, has appointed day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he has Raise him from the dead, God Almighty. We're going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. Thank God for us today. Thank God for us today. You must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And all of us we're going to have to give an account of the deeds that have been done in our body. But when we have this conquering at this author said in this lesson topic today, when we have this eternal hope, we don't have to worry about our day that we're going to have to stand before Christ. When we have this eternal hope, we can rest with the assurance of knowing that God will receive us in according to the works that we have done. Now, old crazy saying, but it's true. If you haven't done no work, don't expect no pay. Jesus says to us, the sea gonna give up that dead. And if your name hasn't been written in the Lamb Book of Life, I'm afraid you're going to have to go to Houston, which is going to be the second death. I have, in spite of whatever happened, I know that there is eternal hope that when I pass from this life, I shall live eternally in the divine presence of God our Father. Let us repeat the mission pledge. I'm persuaded by the teaching of the blessed Bible, by daily reading, meditation, and communion with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to live an upright Christian life. And living a Christian life, we need to learn how to teach young folk what to do. 
Finally, he says, to these ends I pledge to devote myself and seek divine aid and guidance daily that I may become a living witness and a bright and shining light for my Lord. So let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, if you love the Lord, you ought to say, amen, amen. Thank God for us. Love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Glad to see you. Glad to see each of you. Pray for us. You pray for me, and I'll pray for you. God bless us. Have a smile upon us, as the Lord will. I will see us Sunday, 9 o'clock, Sunday school, 10 o'clock, morning worship. Let me also, while I'm on two here, say this again so we can, for those of you who are listening to us, I'm on, we're going to have to cut the Sunday school off so we can give Brother Stanley time to do what he has to do. And perhaps uh, <clears throat> no later than about 20 minutes to a quarter to 10, we need to be uh, then closed down on the Sunday school so Brother Stanley would have a chance to do what he has to do so we can be able to move at 10. All right, Brother Stanley. All right, hope the rest of us will get that together, that we'll do that. So we'll be able to shut it down about 9.30. Uh, so by quarter to 10 or so, we can be able to shut it down, completely shut it off, and Brother Stanley can get a chance to do what he has to do. Bless us. Have a smile upon us. Salonata. <laughs>